going to come, I'm sure. They're just entering right now. Well, that was quick. So we are streaming on live on YouTube already? Um, yes, let me, it's just loading. Can you see yeah. the last Here's video. the link if you want to share it somewhere. Yeah. People who have Facebook or Twitter accounts, can you please share this link that is now in the chat? Your Facebook account or your Twitter account? Yeah. You know, so that we do let the world know that we are online. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> if I propose we wait a couple more minutes and then and then start. Wait. Who's who's going to uh, moderate today? Um, I am. Great. Hello. Hello, Bill. Okay, uh, let's start. People might still be trickling in, but it's okay. Um, so today we venture in the 18th century, which is a bit unusual for us. We have a session on uh, David Hume that I will be moderating. Um, just please turn off your uh, mic during the presentations and write questions in the chat uh, if you have them during the talk. So because the talks are pretty different, uh, we're going to do a split Q&A. So Graham will, will go first and then we'll have 30 minutes of, uh, of questions for him. Um, and then uh, Michael will go and then uh, we will have um, questions for him. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce Graham Clay from uh, Notre Dame. Um, he has a very provocative title, which is that Hume should deny the law of the excluded middle. I think everyone's curious to hear why. So Graham, you have the floor. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, it all starts with the provocative title, but uh, we'll see if I can uh, back it up. Let me share my screen right quick. Okay, so you should be able to see my, my slide, just my first main slide. Yeah, perfect. So the title of my talk is Hume should deny the law of excluded middle. Um, Though we'll see, you know, whether it's Hume himself who should deny it or um, a Humean, maybe. So one thing that's going to come up in the course of this talk is um, kind of different spins that we could um, make on some of Hume's principles and whether Hume himself would endorse them um, less clear at times um, because he doesn't say a whole ton about logic. He doesn't say a whole ton about modality. Um, and so at times you'll see me kind of filling in the gaps in a Humean way. And other times I'll be talking mainly about the texts. Um, just a little bit of background on this. I'm working on a paper where I'm arguing for this title here, Hume should deny the law of excluded middle. And then I'm working on a paper where I argue that a Humean should deny law of excluded middle. So that's why I'm working on both at the same time. So you'll see me kind of maybe slide back and forth feel free to call me out on that if you'd like to hear more about what Hume would say about something or what maybe a Hume Mian would say about something. So I'm going to try to keep it as much as I can on Hume himself. But again, at times, I'll fill in the gaps. So if I get my slides working, OK. This is the big picture of the talk. It's well known that a few of Hume's principles can be used to establish that there are no necessary connections between distinct things, events, entities, objects. You see this phrase these different ways. We see Hume arguing in this way throughout his corpus. Here's some passages if you'd like to note them. And we also see contemporary philosophers influenced by Hume, like Armstrong and Lewis, making similar moves. And I'll have, I have, I have a bibliography uh, slide at the end, so you can check out these. 
references. So Jessica Wilson has an article where she talks about contemporary humans, how they make similar moves in contemporary metaphysics literature. So it's kind of like a common, commonly known thing, maybe one of the most commonly known things about what Hume thinks, that no necessary connections between distinct things. Now, the Humeans obviously put some further uh, spins on this, some extra details. But as I'm going to argue, these same principles can also be used to establish the possible non-existence of propositions like 37 times 19 equals 703. Given that the contraries of these propositions are necessarily non-existent because they imply contradictions, there is a Humean pathway to the negation of the law of excluded middle. So today I'll discuss this pathway, focusing for simplicity on the Hume of the treatise, um, though I think similar things can be said elsewhere. So what's the first principle? It's Hume's famous separability principle. He uses this principle repeatedly, and he initially expresses it as the claim that, and the bold and the underline obviously are me, uh, whatever objects are different are distinguishable. So that's part of it. And that whatever objects are distinguishable are separable by the thought and imagination. And then he says, the same thing goes in the inverse. Whatever objects are separable are also distinguishable. And that what other, whatever objects are distinguishable are also different. So notice the, the last bit on this. So there's the difference, distinguishability, and then separable by the thought and imagination. That latter part needs to be clarified further. Here's some further passages, by the way. So the way I'm going to formulate that latter part is as follows. So the first part is different if and only if distinguishable. Second part is distinguishable if and only if clearly and distinctly conceivable that one exists and it's not the case that the other exists and vice versa. So on the prior slide, we saw that Hume says distinguishable if and only if separable by the thought and imagination. My formulation is that he's a, is this is that he's asserting this. This is his clarified or considered view. So it's clearly and distinctly conceivable that one exists and that the other does not. This is the standard interpretation, and we'll see why in a second. So Don Garrett agrees with this. Baxter, Akamura recently. But why? Let me show you the passages. So when he says the principle in other locations. He clarifies the view. So I'll just read this passage. He says, though we allow the world to be at present a plenum, we may easily conceive it to be deprived of motion. And this idea will certainly be allowed to be, uh, be allowed possible. It must also be allowed possible to conceive the annihilation of any part of matter by the omnipotence of the deity while the other parts remain at rest. For as every idea that is distinguishable is separable by the imagination, and as every idea that is separable by the imagination may be conceived to be separately existent. Then he says, "'Tis evident that the existence of one particle of matter no more implies the existence of another than a square figure in one body implies a square figure in everyone." Now, this last inference relies on his conceivability principle, which I'll come to in a minute. But notice in the second to last underlined and bolded section, he says that every idea that is separable by the imagination may be conceived to be separately existent, which matches my formulation. Here's another passage. So he presents his two principles here. First, he presents what's called the conceivability principle. Again, I'll come to that in a minute. This is whatever is clearly conceived may exist, and whatever is clearly conceived after any manner may exist after the same manner. This is one principle. That's the conceivability principle. Then he says the separability principle. Everything which is different is distinguishable, and everything which is distinguishable is separable by the imagination. And what does he conclude from both? Since all our perceptions are different from each other and from everything else in the universe, they are also distinct and separable and may be considered as separately existent and may exist separately and have no need of anything else to support their existence. So when he combines the separability principle with the conceivability principle, which he states at the very top, whatever is clear, considerably, clearly conceived may exist, he, has a, he infers to a conclusion about separate existence. So it's possible that one exists without the other, 
possible the other exists without the one. So it's clear that he understands the severability principle in this way. Otherwise, he couldn't link it up with the conceivability principle to get his result. So again, this is my formulation. Difference tracks with distinguishability. Distinguishability tracks with uh, clearly, distinctly conceivable separate existence. And that goes both ways. So if two beings are distinguishable, then we can clearly distinctly conceive one existing without the other, the other existing without the one. So that's a separability principle. As I've already mentioned, because it's kind of hard to mention one without the other, Hume's passages often make use of both. There's the conceivability principle. As we've just seen, he sometimes press, expresses it in a slogan form, like whatever we conceive is possible. But he more carefully expresses it elsewhere, as I've alluded to, as applying only to clear and distinct conceptions. So he says, whatever can be conceived by a clear and distinct idea necessarily implies the possibility of existence. And as we saw in the prior slide, he asserts that whatever is clearly conceived may exist, and whatever is clearly conceived after any manner may exist after the same manner. So there's different versions of this principle, but it looks like the kind of considered fold out, fleshed out full bore version is the clear and distinct version. So I formulate it as follows. If it is clearly and distinctly conceivable that X, then it is possible that X. So even though I formulate it this way, I will sometimes drop the qualifier that it's, that it's clearly and distinctly conceivable just because it's hard to say it so many times. So if I say conceivable, I'll mean this, though we'll come back to this later. Now we need one more principle. We're almost there, trust me. Tons of different ways to formulate what I'm gonna call the distinguishability principle. Here's one. So there's a ton of instances of this schema. The arithmetical proposition that 43 plus 19 equals 62 is distinguishable from the arithmetical proposition that 37 times 19 equals 703. The chromatic proposition that crimson is darker than scarlet is distinguishable from the historical proposition that Caesar crossed the Rubicon. So I don't really know my colors that well, so I, I'll just show this for those of you who are like me, don't really know what crimson or scarlet look like relative to one another. So crimson is darker than scarlet. So we've got distinguishability principles. Again, this is a kind of a class. We can generate infinite such principles. These are all just distinguishability claims about different propositions. So we can distinguish these from one another. So Hume's nominalism requires him to maintain that our ideas of these propositions are what he calls abstract ideas. So per the early part of the treatise 117, for Hume, abstract ideas are what we today would call concrete, specific ideas of specific instantiations of general propositions or properties. So on Hume's view, we associate these concrete ideas with linguistic expressions, like the word red maybe, and they act for us as representatives of other such instantiations, their so-called revival set, to use a phrase from Don Garrett. So the big idea is you're going around in the world, you notice a ton of red things, you begin to apply the term red to them, you group them together in virtue of this shared term, and when you hear the word red, on Hume's view, you'll, uh, if you understand the meaning, you'll have uh, one of those particular instances of red pop into your mind's eye, and that will be your exemplar or representative for your concept or idea of red. So that one kind of stands for the others for you. So this is abstract ideas. My assertion here on this slide is that our ideas of these propositions, the ones I just listed, since they're general, they aren't maximally specific. They actually apply to a ton of different instances. So when I say crimson is darker than scarlet, that, that actually, there's a whole set of crimsons that are darker than scarlets, another set of those. So we're, we're referring to an abstract idea here. Now, whatever one's exemplar ideas for these general, general propositions are, Hume would hold that they and their objects are distinguishable. That's the important thing. So our idea of the, I'm gonna go back to the prior slide, our idea of crimson being darker than scarlet 
distinguishable from our idea of Caesar crossing the Rubicon. Likewise, Caesar crossing the Rubicon, distinguishable from crimson being darker than scarlet. So on the idea level and on the reality level, we have distinguishability. Now, almost to the argument. A model for this argument is what Hume says about causation. So here's a classic passage where Hume takes these same principles in, in the causal domain to establish one of his most famous negative conclusions about causation. So I'll read it. Hume says, all distinct ideas are separable from each other. And as the ideas of cause and effect are evidently distinct, it will be easy for us to conceive any object to be non-existent this moment and existent the next without conjoining to it the distinct idea of a cause or productive principle. The separation, therefore, of the idea of a cause from that of a beginning of existence is plainly possible for the imagination. And consequently, the actual separation of these objects is so far possible that it implies no contradiction nor absurdity and is therefore incapable of being refuted by any reasoning from mere ideas without which it is impossible to demonstrate the necessity of a cause. So here's Hume using the same principles we've just seen, distinctness uh, of causes and effects, conceivability principle to generate no necessary connections between causes and effects. So I'm gonna kind of model my position after that, except I'm not interested in causal relations. I'm interested in others, so we'll see. So first pre premise, the chromatic proposition that crimson is darker than scarlet is distinguishable from the historical proposition that Caesar crossed the Rubicon. Again, feel free to substitute in your favorite proposition, distinguishability proposition, if something's off about this one for you. Separability principle, it's necessary that for all X and Y, X and Y are distinguishable, if and only if it is clearly distinctly conceivable that X exists and it's not the case that Y exists. And it is clearly distinctly conceivable that Y exists and it's not the case that X exists. Conceivability principle, it is necessary that for all X, if it is clearly and distinctly conceivable that X, then it is possible that X. So what follows from this? It's necessary that it is possible that the proposition that Caesar crossed the Rubicon exists. And it is not the case that the proposition that crimson is darker than scarlet exists. So it is necessary that it is possible that it is not the case that the proposition that crimson is darker than scarlet exists. So this latter proposition, of course, is a necessary one. Feel free to plug in your favorite arithmetical one if the color, the chromatic proposition, is not to your fancy. As a Humean, uh, got to go to the colors. So the crucial thing here is that this is a surprising result to pause here. So this is only one half of the overall argument. But what we're saying is Hume's argument against necessary connections can actually be applied to necessary propositions themselves. The scope of the separability principle and the conceivability principle is unbridled, not limited. Does it range over what you might have thought it ranged over? Hume never says that it only is limited to the sorts of things that can be causes and effects, for instance. We can apply it to propositions in the way that I have, whether they're necessary or not. Um, and it need not be uh, individual causes or causal events. So we end up with this claim number one. And now we need to go after the second piece of the puzzle. So remember, the ultimate goal is to go after the negation of the LEM. So we, we're, right now, we've ruled out one side. We're going to need to rule out the other side. What else is needed to arrive at the negation of the LEM? The other half turns on the claim that what I'm going to call two. It is not the case that it's possible that the proposition that crimson is lighter than scarlet exists. So this is the negation of the proposition that crimson is darker than scarlet. So this proposition says, proposition two says, it is not the case that it's possible that a necessary falsehood exists. Well, where can we go here? The proposition that crimson is lighter than scarlet exists implies a contradiction. It implies that there's a crimson entity that is lighter than a scarlet entity. Or if you want to take an arithmetical truth, the equalities that I presented earlier, those the negations of those imply that there exists one thing that's not 
equal in quantity to one thing. From this claim, though, it follows that it's not the case that it's possible that this proposition exists, at least with the following principle in hand. I'm going to call it no contradictory possibilities. It says, for all propositions p, if that p implies a contradiction, then it's not the case that it's possible that p. So there's passages where Hume seems to indicate he endorsed this principle. I'm not going to go into him due to time. For one, one place he does is that it seems to justify his view that something's conceivable only if what's conceived is not implying a contradiction. So Hume seems to have a no contradictions view in general. And that explains why he thinks that contradictions themselves are not conceivable, a principle that he uses in many, many spots in his corpus. But I'll come more to this in a minute. For what it's worth, this principle here is accepted by most contemporary uh, metaphysicians. No contradictory possible worlds. OK, so let's put the pieces together and then get to some complications if I have time. So from that claim, it follows that it's necessary that it's not the case that the proposition that crimson is lighter than scarlet exists. But then note this further claim that I'm going to call Q. For all propositions x and y, if it is necessary that x and it is possible that y, then it is possible that x and y. I can prove this claim, but it takes like 15 steps, so I'm not going to show you. I can show you later if you're interested. From Q1, the modal axiom d and the modal axiom 4 and 2 star, it follows that 3. It's possible that, and then parentheses, it is not the case that crimson is darker than scarlet exists and is not the case that crimson is lighter than scarlet exists. So we've got two sides of the coin, p and not p. So what this is saying is it's possible that it's not the case that p exists, and it's not the case that not p exists. Using De Morgan's laws follows that it's possible that it's not the case that either crimson is darker than scarlet exists, or crimson is lighter than scarlet exists. From this, it follows the negation of the modal version of the law of excluded middle, I'll come to this at the end. It's not the case that it's necessary that for all x, either x exists or not x exists. So given that this is a proof for the negation of this claim, we have a contradiction. From this contradiction, we can infer this very claim, the negation, via implication, introduction, and modus tollens. So that's kind of the gist of the whole thing. On the one side, we have uh, necessary the negation of a necessary proposition, which is impossible because it implies a contradiction. So that's kind of the easy side. And the first side is, is a little tougher. That's trying to say that it's possible, at least, that the, um, uh, the necessary proposition, proposition itself does not exist. To get there, I use the conceivability principle with the separability principle and the distinguishability principle. OK, so in what's time, what time is left? I think of about 10 minutes. I'm going to talk about some kind of issues in the territory. So there's one natural objection that I'm going to drive towards. I'm going to try to help Hume out. So first objection is trouble for the separability principle. An objector would need to argue that for some x, x is distinguishable from some other entity, and yet it is not the case that it's conceivable that it's not the case that x exists. As this audience knows very well, it's a venerable view that inconceivability claims can be justified by showing that the object of the purported conception implies a contradiction. I mentioned this earlier. So Hume endorses this. I believe Barclay endorses this. Leibniz endorses this. And David Chalmers endorses this. Common view. In the present case, where P is the proposition that crimson is darker than scarlet, Hume, or maybe the Humean, again, this is the slide I mentioned at the outset, can and should grant that not P exists implies a contradiction. That crimson is lighter than scarlet exists implies a contradiction, given that it implies that there's a crimson entity that is lighter than a scarlet entity. Yet the proposition that not P exists is not identical to the proposition that it's not the case that P exists. Remember. We're talking about the LEM here. We're looking at an argument against it. Don't want to presume it. Still, the fact that the crimson is lighter than scarlet exists implies a contradiction, opens an avenue for the objector. 
If the proposition that is not the case that P exists, where P is the proposition that crimson is darker than Charlotte, is conjoined with the LEM, the new proposition, the conjunction, implies that not P exists, and so implies a contradiction, and is therefore inconceivable. Here's an argument that expresses what I just said. So first claim for all propositions, if that P implies a contradiction, then it's not the case that it's conceivable that P. This is just the general uh, no, no conceivable contradictions principle. That not P exists where P is the proposition that crimson is darker than scarlet implies a contradiction. So that crimson is lighter than scarlet implies a contradiction. For all propositions P, that it is not the case that P and either P or not P implies that not P. So that it is not the case that crimson is darker than scarlet exists and either crimson is darker than scarlet exists or crimson is lighter than scarlet exists implies that crimson is lighter than scarlet exists. But for all propositions, if X implies Y and if Y implies a contradiction, then X implies a contradiction. So that is not the case that crimson is darker than scarlet exists and either crimson is darker than scarlet exists or crimson is lighter than scarlet exists implies a contradiction. So it's not the case that it's conceivable that both these things. So in other words, if we combine a claim like it's not the case that crimson is darker than scarlet exists and a claim like either crimson is darker than scarlet exists or crimson is lighter than scarlet exists, we end up with a contradiction. We can't conceive those things. And since the proposition that this, this is the long proposition. It's not the case that crimson is darker than scarlet exists, and either crimson is darker than scarlet exists or crimson is lighter than scarlet exists, is distinguishable from pick any proposition, pick anything. United States is in North America. And yet it's not the case that it's conceivable that, that conjunction, it follows that the left or right direction of the second conjunct of the separability principle is false. In other words, it's not the case if you have something, two things that are distinguishable, then it's clearly distinctly conceivable that X exists. It's not the case that Y exists. This is, sounds pretty complicated, but it's pretty simple. The big idea is just if contradictions are inconceivable, we can conjoin stuff together with any proposition to create contradictions that then they can't, then they can't be conceived because they entail contradictions. So take any proposition, conjoin its negation with it. That isn't conceivable because it's a contradiction. So it seems like the separability principle in its maximal generality can't be retained. How can we help out Hume here? Well, notably, the proposition in question that it's not the case that crimson is darker than scarlet exists implies a contradiction only if it is conjoined with other propositions. In the present case, it's this disjunction. So while this big conjunction implies a con contradiction, and so cannot be conceived if our first principle is true. Again, the principle that I said all these folks have endorsed for centuries. The proposition that it's not the case that crimson is darker than scarlet exists does not apply a contradiction, so A's truth is immaterial to it. Recall A is the claim that for all propositions, if that P prime implies a contradiction, then it's not conceivable. In other words, like, sure, just because we can conjoin propositions together, create contradictions, can't conceive those things doesn't mean that the that the conjuncts conceivability is in trouble. So reflecting on the conceivability of propositions like these reveals apparent trouble for the objector. After all, some have famously argued that it's conceivable that the world has only two entities. If they're right and these entities are conceivable as lacking further parts, some complications about what's being conceived here. It's conceivable that it's not the case that 37 times 19 equals 703 exists. And there appear to be many other propositions where the proposition that not P exists implies a contradiction, but it's conceivable that it's not the case that P exists, so long as the LEM is not conjoined to the proposition that it's not the case that P exists and thus added to the content of the conception. So to use our chromatic example, crimson is darker than scarlet, the proposition that crimson is lighter than scarlet exists, not P exists, is not conceivable because it implies a contradiction. 
However, it is conceivable that it's not the case that crimson is darker than scarlet exists because it's conceivable that there's no crimson entities. So though we might have to abandon the separability principle in its full generality, it doesn't seem to matter for the core of Hume's argument. After all, we can go back to the orig original formulation, instantiate it just to one case, and get the same result. So what can the objector say? This comes to the objection that I said has a bit more staying power. I'm going to try to help Hume out, though. So the objector needs to argue directly that it's not the case that it's conceivable, that it's not the case that some such proposition exists. You guys have probably been thinking, wait, these propositions are necessary. It's necessary that crimson is darker than scarlet. It's necessary that whatever arithmetical propositions I said earlier. If the necessity of a proposition implies that it exists, and if to clearly and distinctly conceive such a proposition requires conceiving this aspect of it, then Hume or the Humean may be in trouble here. So here's the two principles from before. If that P implies a contradiction, then it's not the case that it's conceivable that P. If X implies Y and Y implies a contradiction, then X implies a contradiction, trivial. Now a new claim, the one I just mentioned. That is necessary that P implies that P exists. People will say necessary beings or necessary propositions exist in all possible worlds. So what follows from this, that it is necessary that P, and it is not the case that P exists, implies that P exists, and it's not the case that P exists. Add another claim for all propositions P, that P exists, and is not the case that P exists, implies a contradiction, straightforward. So that it is necessary that P, and is not the case that P exists, implies a contradiction. So it is not the case that it's conceivable that it is necessary that P, and it's not the case that P exists. For all propositions P, if it is necessary that P and it is conceivable that it is necessary that P, then it's not the case that it's conceivable that it is not the case that it's necessary that P. In other words, if something's necessary, you got to conceive it as such. So for all propositions, if it is necessary that P and it is conceivable that it is necessary that P, then it's not the case that it's conceivable that it's not the case that P exists. What is this saying? The key claims here are H and M. These are the additional claims. J is trivial. And I've already covered A and E, and the rest are derived. So just focus on these two. H just says, if something's necessary, it exists. So it exists in actual world, we might say. Why? The traditional answer, it exists in all possible worlds. That's what it is to be necessary. M says, if something's necessary, and it's conceivable that it's necessary, so it's not something too complex to conceive or something like that, then you have to conceive it as necessary. Why might th you think that? Well. Go back to the assumption I made at this get go, which is that this is about clear and distinct conception. So, as this audience is probably better informed than me by a long shot, clear and distinct conception might require conceiving all of the properties that distinguish the object of the conception from the others, have them in kind of in clear, clearly in mind's eye, and so on. So, it's natural thought that if we're going to conceive of a necessary proposition clearly and distinctly, we got to conceive of it as necessary. To not do so would be to miss something fundamental about its nature. So where can Hume go here? This looks like trouble, because it looks like H is endorsed by most everybody these days, and M is very plausible if we make clear and distinct conception at all robust. And again, all the other ones, A and E, he, he, he endorses, J is trivial, and all the others are derived. So here's H. How do you get H? Well. Modal axiom T, if it is necessary that X, then X. And this other claim, P if and only if P exists. Hume grants the latter. He thinks existence isn't a real predicate, to use Kant's terms. And with the former, I already said, it's pretty plausible. Looks like Hume is going to have to go after axiom T. It seems that Hume should regret re reject it, and that he does, actually. So when we look at the text again, Hume says, necessity is something that exists in the mind, not in the objects. So when he's talking about causation, he says, either we have no idea of necessity, or as necessity is nothing but that determination of the thought to pass from causes to effects and from effects to causes, according to their experienced union. So his positive account of causation. 
But then he says something very interesting. Thus as the necessity which makes two times two equal to four or three angles of a triangle equal to two right ones lies only in the act of the understanding by which we consider and compare these ideas. So here Hume seems to be saying something like the rejection of T, namely that necessity lies in the act of the understanding. If you don't have the act of the understanding, you don't have the proposition, even if it's a necessary one. Here's some other passages. When Hume's talking about what it is for a proposition to be intuitable or demonstrable, these are his um, kind of a bit of a backstory here, but these are necessary claims. So anything that can be intuited or de demonstrated is necessary on Hume's view. He thinks in these cases, one is necessarily determined to conceive them as they are, either immediately, that's the intuition, or by the interposition of other ideas. Likewise, when he says when a demonstration convinces him of anything, it not only makes him conceive the proposition, but also makes him aware that it couldn't have been conceived otherwise. But crucially, he doesn't think that we're conceiving the necessary propositions all the time. He doesn't think we have them all in mind. It's just that when we conceive them, we can't conceive them but in this particular way. So when we conceive 2 plus 2 equals 4, we can't conceive 2 plus 2 equals 5. That doesn't mean we're always conceiving 2 plus 2 equals 4. So we can still reject axiom t, right? And then kind of the kicker, the final like icing on the cake, is when he addresses this explicitly in the dialogues. So he, when he's talking about necessary existence in particular, Hume says, it will be possible for us at any time to conceive the non-existence of what we formerly conceived to exist. Nor can the mind ever lie under a necessity of supposing any object to remain always in being in the same manner as we lie under a necessity of always conceiving twice two to be four. The words therefore necessary existence have no meaning or which is the same thing, none that is consistent. So he doesn't deny that there's a necessity in the case of twice two equals four, but it's not necessary existence, which again is the thing asserted by modal, modal axiom T. If it's necessary that X, then X. So what Hume is saying is that necessary propositions have to be conceived in the in the same in the way the same way all the time. You can't conceive two plus two equals five, but that doesn't mean that two plus two equals four always exists, must exist. So for further discussion of this territory, see Holden's 2014 article. So to wrap up, I've defended uh, kind of standard interpretations of some of Hume's principles in order ex uh, to argue for the possible non-existence of necessary propositions. I've then noted that the negation of necessary propositions are necessarily non-existent in order to establish the negation of the law of excluded middle on Hume's behalf. I've noted that there's some complications about the separability principle it looks like in a full generality, it's false because it's maximally general and the X and the Y in the quantifier could be plugged in with something that's self-contradictory. I made some repairs. What did I do? I just retreated from the maximal version of these principles to the ones that I'm, I care about, the pro pro uh, propositions that I can distinguish. Uh, and I've mentioned with the distinguishability principle. Then I've noticed, hey, you might think that necessity is something that requires necessary propositions to exist. That's what necessity is. But then it doesn't look like Hume actually thinks this. This is a contemporary conception of necessity as far as I can tell, or at least it's not Hume's. It's not the conception that necessary beings exist in all possible worlds. It's just that they bear a certain kind of internal relation to one another that must be maintained if they exist, but not that they must exist. Again, his pushback on God here is instructive. He doesn't think that necessary existence makes any sense. So is human consistent? I'll wrap up with this. He says a variety of things that indicates that he is. He says, it is an established maxim in metaphysics that whatever the mind clearly and distinctly conceives includes the idea of possible existence, or in other words, that nothing we imagine is absolutely impossible. The latter version of this is the assertion that it's necessary that if X 
for all x, if it is clearly and distinctly conceivable that x, then it's not the case that x is impossible. This is equivalent to this. It's necessary that it is if it is clearly and distinctly conceivable that x, then it's not the case that it's not the case that it's possible that x. But the problem is that the conceivability principle is equivalent to this assertion only under the assumption of the law of excluded middle. From the law of excluded middle follows double negation elimination, which entails the conceivability principle when conjoined with this assertion. In other words, Hume treats two things that equivalent that aren't equivalent unless the law of excluded middle is assumed. Does this vitiate any of his arguments? I won't go down that road here. I don't think so. I think he can maintain um, the traditional versions of his principles and just avoid sliding back and forth. However, it seems like he wasn't aware of his potential entanglement here. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Sorry. We have a few questions. I, I was muted, yes. Um, we have a few questions in the chat. So let's start with um, Anne-Marie Butler. Thank you. Um, thanks, Graham. It's good to see you again. Um, I'm going to leave the question about what, uh, how we talk about whether a proposition exists to other people who had that question as well. That was what I thought was the most important question for this. But instead, focus on a hobby horse of mine, which is, what is it to conceive that it's not the case that X exists? Um, so my Hume, uh, the historical Hume, is a psychologist. Um, and so logic, uh, logical terms are to be analyzed in terms of ideas and their relations. And so he really runs into a problem of trying to account for negation, but it's super important to his logic and to logic in general. Um, Locke is actually kind of helpful um, and I have to credit Shelley Weinberg for pointing this out to me that negation comes into play for Locke at the level of, of language. And so it's really surprising that Hume doesn't give us a, a, a book on words like Locke does. Um, and so it seems that Hume has to understand negation in terms of relations between ideas. And so I, I, I'd like and my question for you is, can you speak to how you understand negation and conceiving of negative states of affairs for Hume? Yeah, so thanks a lot for the question. Um, I haven't uh, gone down this road that far. Um, at this point, I'm kind of sketching out the broader strokes of this. So I'll say that up front. Um, not really sure yet. Um, the There's a lot of logic under the hood here, too. Like the actual paper is a lot longer. So there's a lot of inferences that actually require a ton more steps. So I've been kind of focused on that um, more than um, all of the pieces. And this is one particular area that I, I'm open, I'm all ears because I don't really uh, know exactly what to say. Um, I do think um, the color examples might be illustrative some. Um, so I have two uh, examples. Uh, I have the math examples of, for the distinguishability principle. And then I have the color ones. So the color ones are crimson is darker than scarlet. And then uh, crimson is lighter than scarlet is the negation. Um, it's not clear to me what he has to say uh, about the what's in, what's in mind uh, when you imagine that it's not the case that crimson is darker than scarlet, but you're not imagining that it's lighter. Um, it seems to me that um, you just don't have it in mind at all, at the very least. I think that's all I need for the argument to work, because um, that's what I want to say about all these necessary propositions, that they're just not in existence, whether mentally, linguistically, or in the world, um, unless they are instantiated in some way. Um, and so this would be a case where um, it's not, not even in mind. Now, then the question is, uh, how is it then distinguishable? Um, that's less clear to me. Um, I'm not sure how you can, you know, distinguish two things where one of them isn't in mind. Um, so that's an area for sure where I still have to figure this out further. Uh, and I mean, maybe that's a point at which Hume is saved in virtue of some uh, wonky views he has on negation, uh, but the Humean might still be in a pickle. Um, so for sure, that's an area that I need to think further about. Thank you. 
Thank you, Graham. Um, and then there were a few questions about the nature of propositions. I think I'll let Dennis um, ask his question, which is also a version of, of Dan's question. Sure, yeah, this is very uh, elementary, really. Uh, I'm, since Hume doesn't explicitly talk about propositions and doesn't name things as propositions that he talks about. So I was wondering what, uh, when we're talking about propositions, what they are for Hume and what is it for a proposition uh, to exist? Because one might have thought, well, well their propositions are complex ideas of, uh, of certain sorts at least. And in that case, they'll be dependent and then uh, the things and they'll be dependent on the mind which combines them, one might think. But if they're not complex ideas of this sort, then it's not quite clear what uh, Hume would identify them as. And there's an additional point here. Uh, if they were complex ideas in the mind uh, of, the, of the thinker, uh, then law of excluded middle might not hold in it. I mean, there are complications concerning the law of excluded middle. One might think, well, there's here's an idea of I have X and the other idea Y. I will combine them. I will combine the neg negation of the, that either. So in the mind, neither X is identical to Y, nor it's not the case that X is identical to Y are present. So law of excluded middle in this instantiation is not in my mind. So it said uh, identifying them as complex ideas would immediately yield uh, a rejection of law of excluded middle, at least understood in this way. So I was wondering well, what you want to say. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Yeah. So. I've gone around and around about this in other contexts about what exactly propositions are for Hume. Um, from what I can tell, he uses the term in three ways. He actually does use the term. Um, this is, uh, the three ways are sentences. So this is something like, you know, uh, utterances or, you know, uh, symbols on a sheet of paper. Um, mental propositions. So these are going to be the complex ideas you're talking about. And then the reference of uh, mental propositions or linguistic propositions. So these would be Caesar crossing the Rubicon at time, whatever, you know, fill in the details. So there's kind of like the in the world propositions. There's the mental ones, which are the complex ideas. These are the, the seven relations if we go by the treatise account. So we've got the matters of fact and the relations of ideas in the inquiry, things get a little more complicated and a little different there. But those are those are the relations, the complex ideas, and then you know sentence tokens or utterances. Um, I'm presuming here that propositions are um, not just complex ideas. So like my Caesar crossed the Rubicon case, or Crimson is darker than Scarlet, has to do with uh, all the instances in the world as well. So these are again these are abstract ideas. So they have um, there's kind of revival sets with tons of members, and some of the members are on the world side, some of them are on the mind side. Um, I see your point, though, about um, if they're all complex ideas, then maybe the pathway to the negation of the LEM is quicker. Um, I, that's very interesting. I'm going to have to explore that. Um, I, I think partially because I'm kind of going down the quasi Humean and not purely Hume road. I'm moving away from this kind of idiosyncratic, mentalistic, um, human position in that human position in that respect. Um, but since I'm working on both papers, um, where I'm talking about human one and the human in the other, maybe my argument can be uh, made quicker in the human paper uh, if I think more about that. Um, so yes, thanks a lot for for both those um, suggestions or thoughts. Um, um, Hanok has a finger on this. Oh, you're muted. Yes. Uh, oh, perfect. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I have both a finger and a hand. Um, so, and they go well together. So I'll put them together. Great. Uh, Great. So um, you, you mentioned uh, you, so that's the finger, you see. Uh, you mentioned Hume's uh, use of the term proposition, but the way we talk about uh, proposition is not uh, the ordinary sense of proposition. You know, it's a kind of construction that came uh, 
developed gradually with Russell and others, it's a term of art, and that's not uh, the way the term was used in the 18th century. So the actual use you make of the term doesn't help us uh, to decide how to uh, impose our uh, concept of opposition on uh, Jung's uh, structure. Now, uh, when I, I think of Jung, I, I don't find our concept of proposition there, because we would like to say, when I'm thinking, it's Tuesday, and you're thinking, it's Tuesday, we're thinking the same thing. But of course, the uh, uh, specific ideas, nuisance that run in my mind and in yours are different. Or uh, when I say, you know, Scarlet is uh, darker than uh, Crimson, or the other way around, I don't remember. Uh, I say, Scarlet is uh, darker than Crimson. You say, yes, sure. We're both thinking the same thought. We have the same proposition in mind, but the actual union ideas instantiated in my mind are not those instantiated in your mind. So uh, if we want to impose our understanding of proposition on you, we shouldn't identify with the ideas instantiated in uh, someone's uh, thought. We should put a different construction there. And this, uh, I think, fits well with the idea or claim that uh, although someone is thinking a thought, that thought might not have existed, but what he's thinking, for instance, scarlet is darker than crimson, this is uh, not the, the thought, the content of the thought, and there we don't talk about existence. So uh, I have uh, difficulties in uh, even in, uh, applying existence to propositions, although I agree that we can apply existence to thoughts, certainly in Hume's sense, but there, that's not where we apply our uh, necessity of uh, propositions. So uh, I, I wasn't convinced by this imposition of our understanding on the Hume's uh, ideas instantiated in the mind. That's not where we should look for our propositions. Thanks. Yeah. Th thanks a lot. Yeah, for sure. I I agree. Very different conceptions of propositions for Hume. Um, it's kind of it's unclear. I mean, as I said, he he seems to use the term in different ways, and it's not clear how they relate to one another. He never kind of offers an account of propositions or something like this. Uh, and then you know, contemporary metaphysicians, like you said, uh, generally are thinking of something very different. You know, something abstract, mind and language independent, something that my uh, utterances can uh, mean or refer to just like yours. Um, um, and I, I mean, this is kind of related to the objection that I'm trying to push back on a, at the end where, um, the Platonist about propositions, um, is going to have to, uh, is have an easy way out in a sense, uh, to this argument because they just think that, uh, the axiom T is, is true in virtue of their metaphysics of propositions. Um, whether this is a good argument against Hume or the Humean, um, not clear. It's, it does seem to me that they're gonna have to establish their conception of propositions, the one you're referring to that's Platonist, um, I think, um, via a priori argument as far as I can tell, because uh, the thrust of Hume's argument is that uh, we can conceive these things. Um, there's uh, the conceivability principle, the separability principle are driving against the Platonist here. Um, so they're gonna have to argue um, that their Platonism or their, and their, you know, it's associated account of propositions as abstract mind and language independent things. Um, they're gonna have to establish that um, through some sort of a priori argument, as far as I can tell. Um, whether they can do that um, uh, is another question. Um, and then, you, you know, you might always think too, uh, yeah, they're going to they're gonna prefer to do that than give up the LEM. I mean, that's the problem with any argument against any logical principle is it just looks like it's going to have, you know, you're going to try to find a premise uh, and go for it, re rejecting it rather than rejecting the law of excluded middle. Um, so they're going to try their darndest to establish their view of propositions um, at maybe Hume's expense. Um, 
I guess my only response to this sort of thing is just to think it maybe is just a suggestion. I mean, A, I'm thinking about it more. I need to think about it more. But here's a suggestion. I, it's not really clear to me if all the contemporary metaphysicians agree about this. So the kind of the, the trope is that they do, that there are all these, uh, that they're Platonists and that propositions are such and such way. But there's a lot of disagreement in that literature, as far as I can tell. Um, and the people I've talked to who work in this area think that there's not really much of a consensus. So just kind of the, that view is used as a filler view. Um, and then even at worst, this argument is a kind of a pressure on them to think more hard, uh, harder about their view on propositions. Because if that's the way out, um, then they're going to need to kind of uh, come to a Platonist position to enable them to escape. Um, so all that's to say, I really appreciate the comment. And I need to, in each of the papers, deal with the different ways in which propositions are understood for sure, and be really careful not to uh, conflate the two. Um, and at, I've just kind of glossed over it here in this presentation um, in a way that might not ultimately work. Great. Um, um, may I have a small finger? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, good. Uh, so really, I'll try to make it uh, my small finger. Um, I wasn't, and I'm not that bothered by uh, you know, dismissing the law of excluded middle. If uh, some system leads me to uh, dismiss it, uh, uh, for this or that reason, fine. What bothered me more is the way you read propositions into uh, Jung's uh, system, whatever the consequence uh, would be for the law of excluded uh, middle. Um, even before getting to that uh, law and juggling uh, the modal concepts, uh, it's a question, how can I and you, uh, how can you incorporate me and you thinking the same thing Although the ideas instantiated in my mind and in yours, you me and ideas are very different, different tokens, and they, they can be very different. But I promised a small finger, so I'm I stop here. Thank you. Yeah, so I I I in a sense I completely agree. I think there's a lot of complications that I need, you know, in the Hume paper, I need to have a whole section on the proposition side. Um, and then argue for a particular way of understanding Hume on propositions, um, the way that I've presumed here to make this work, namely that propositions come in three kinds, the LEM ranges over all of them um, and all that um, in a way that you know would take 20 slides of its own. Um, so I completely take the point on board. Great, we have about seven minutes and at least two questions. So Dan, uh, Dan had a finger on this. Uh, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to um, belabor the point, but there is a there is a passage where he does. Um, oops, am I? Am, can you hear me, Claudia? Okay. Yes. There, there is there is a passage in the um, a, um, um, inquiry concerning human understanding, where he does use proposition in a way that is kind of like what you're using, Clark, but a little different. He says. These two propositions are far from being the same. Um, I, I have found that such an object has always been attended with such an effect. And, and this is the second one, I foresee that other objects which are in appearance similar will be attended with similar effects. Um, and he claims that, and there he's talking about the distinctness of those two propositions in the sense in which you're interested in that. But what he means by the distinctness is not that one can exist while the other not exist, but that one can be true while the other is not true. Um, but what I'm wondering is, which, which suggests that I don't think he thinks of uh, propositions as things that can be you know, quantified over um, and about which you can talk, do they exist, do they not exist? But I'm wondering if you can, sort of paraphrase your points without using the word proposition. Yes, I, I th uh, so thanks for, for all, all of that. Um, the passages you're talking about in the inquiry, I've looked at those and those are kind of some of the clearer cases where he uses the word proposition. And I right. think 
many of them indicate the kind of the threefold account that I was talking about. He'll use italics to refer to maybe a, a sentence token right. um, and all that. So thank you for mentioning those. Um, uh, the point about truth, which is the second point, I'm not really sure what Hume's views are on truth. Um, so that's one thing I kind of punted on. The version of the law of excluded middle that comes out of this is a th something about existence, not about truth. And you might think the law of excluded middle is about truth. So in the longer form version of this, I have some bridge principles to get to the truth version of the law of excluded middle. It's not, it's not clear at all to me what he thinks about truth. There's like two passages where he talks about it explicitly and they're kind of weird. It's hard for me to figure out what exactly he's up to there. Um, but that's certainly an area I need to think a lot more about um, for sure. Uh, and um, in, this, in this particular case, it does seem to me that when he's talking about the distinctness of the propositions, he simply means the one can be true and the other false or vice versa. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna have to, I, I take in, that on board. A, in, I've, got, I've made a note of in, it. I'm gonna have to think about that. Yeah, but in, 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 in not a technically rich sense, but just in the sort of common sense, he certainly does believe that some propositions are true and some propositions are false, whatever deep views he may have about truth. Right. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree about that. Uh, whether I, I, what I am not sure about is whether in that passage, that's what he's saying when he says they're distinct or he implies that they're distinct. Um, um, and then what was your last point? Sorry, there's three points. Well, I, well the last was a question. Can you paraphrase? the point that you're making about Hume, your argument, without using the word proposition at all. Right, it seems like I could. So I'm trying to kind of bring him in contact with uh, kind of the broader philosophical tradition, the contemporary analytic tradition, um, by using this proposition term, which gets me into all sorts of trouble. But it seems like I could just run it all in terms of relations, um, maybe even just keep it to relations of ideas, um, the knowledge relations or knowable relations. Um, so the scarlet crimson case is a case of a qualitative relation. Um, and so you might think uh, I could just limit the whole argument uh, to relations, which is what um, Dennis was saying um, earlier uh, is maybe an option. Um, maybe then that would get me the negation of the LEM just because it's not true in a particular subdomain and then I can generalize from there. So that's, that's something that I'm, I'm going to explore further. Now, does... Does that form of the LEM kind of, is that the one he would be using? I think so, because I mean, he generally thinks at least in the treatise in terms of relations. So if he can't use the LEM in its full generality uh, with respect to relations, so you know, running it in this more limited um, quantifier of relations sense, um, then that might cause trouble for him anyway. Um, whether uh, that's the type of, that's the version of the LEM that he's using in the inconsistency case that I mentioned at the end, it's not clear. Uh, I don't know if the conceivability principle uh, is a relation or is a, you know, a logical construction out of relations either. So, um, yes, thank you. I, I'll have to think more about this uh, further. Thank you. Uh, last question, Monica. You're muted. I'm actually good. So Dan kind of um, asked said some things that I, I want to think more about and I'll just email Graham my question. If anybody else has a quick one, then I'll, I'll leave it up to them. Thank you so much. Yeah, we might. Oh, okay, D Daria, can your question go very yes. quick? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, okay. it's very, 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 very naive. If we have to, I, I wrote these two different arithmetical propositions, which are meaning the same, yes? six multiplied by two is equal to 12 and so on. If we can distinguish them, can it be that one true and another is false? Or one exists and one other doesn't exist? Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, notice in the cases that I picked, they weren't um, uh, pairs of propositions like these. Um, I picked ones that are wildly different from one another to avoid this precise uh, potential complication. I'm not sure. So I, I think, you know, on some contemporary conceptions, they are not distinct and that's the way out here. Um, uh, but on Hume's conception, not clear to me. Um, for one, you're asking whether they're true. One can be true and the other false. I'm not really clear on his views on truth and falsehood. Um, uh, especially when applied to relations of ideas. When he does talk about that, he says some kind of weird stuff. Um, uh, 
but for sure, uh, the scope of my, the scope of the principles that I use to get to my conclusion definitely needs to be sensitive to this sort of case, whatever I ultimately say about this. So I, I see that I see the worry. Thank you. Okay, we are now out of time for the session. Uh, if anyone wants to save the chat with the rest of the questions and the points, it is possible to do that in, in Zoom. You just go to the uh, right of the chat window and there is like a three dot thing and you can save the chat. Okay, thank you, Graham. Uh, that Thanks was great. Um, and now we'll move on uh, to Michael Jacobides, who's going to talk about uh, human miracles, the anti-Catholic background to Hume's essay on miracles. Oh, perfect, we can see your screen. Okay. Great. Well, I want to uh, thank the organizers, not just for this session, but for uh, sort of a nice, a nice window into philosophy during during what's otherwise a somewhat cramped time. Um, before I leave the first screen, I do want to say that um, one bad thing about this way of doing philosophy is that it's it's hard to ask questions after the session, and so consider yourself invited that if you have a question that either occurs to you after we end or uh, you're too shy to give or for whatever reason, let me welcome you to email me the question. Okay, uh, soon after the town council of Edinburgh decides not to offer Hume a position as professor of moral philosophy, the city is occupied for a month by an insurrectionist Catholic army supported by a foreign power. Under the command of Charles Edward Stuart, these Jacobites attempt to restore the Catholic Stuart monarchy to Great Britain. The reaction to the rebellion of 1745 is the peak of anti-Catholic sentiment in Britain in the 18th century. Sermons are preached against popery, priests are imprisoned, and there are anti-Catholic riots across the island. In 1748, the readers of Hume's first inquiry wouldn't have been tempted to believe in the genuineness of Catholic miracles. At the beginning of part two of his essay on miracles, Hume lists four arguments for the unreliability of testimony for specifically religious miracles. I want to show that understanding two of these arguments depends on looking at them in their British anti-Catholic context. In effect, Hume argues that if you believe in the miracles of the Bible, then you ought to be a Catholic. But Catholicism is absurd, so you ought not believe in the miracles of the Bible. This reading is important uh, in its direct implications since Hume's essay is on an important topic and the first inquiry is an important book. Another lesson is that understanding the form of an argument sometimes requires knowing the presuppositions of its readers. So no one is executed for being a Catholic priest in England or Scotland in the 18th century as they had been in earlier years. According to Colin Hayden had, quote, the massive array of anti-papist laws been rigorously enforced, Catholicism could scarcely have survived in it. So for example, Roman worship was illegal and the penalty for a priest saying mass was perpetual imprisonment. In the 18th century, this and many other uh, statutes are not strictly enforced, but the Catholics in the 1740s are truly excluded from the military and civil offices and from practicing law. They can't enter Oxford, they can't graduate from Cambridge, and they are subjected to a double land tax. The roots of Scottish attitudes to Latter-day miracles lie in John Calvin's polemics. So to the demand from Catholics that Protestants should produce miracles in defense of their reforms, Calvin replies that reformers had the miracles of the gospels, that Catholic miracles are so frivolous that they undermine faith, that Satan has his miracles, that the Donatists use miracles as a battering ram, and that Augustine warned us against trusting in wonder workers. Calvin concludes, we then have no lack of miracles, sure miracles that cannot be denied, but those to which our opponents lay claim are mere delusions of Satan. So the ones that cannot be denied are the miracles of the gospels, and then once you stray from that, you're going into satanic territory. Okay, so Scotland's reformers uh, follow in Calvin's footsteps and the first article of the Westminster Confession, which is the confession that governs Scotland during our period and, and, uh, and today, uh, declares, it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners 
to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto the church and to commit the same holy unto writing, which make it the holy scripture to be most necessary. Uh, these former, man, I feel like I uh, quoted this wrong. These former ways of God's revealing his will unto the people being now ceased. So here's the idea that uh, revelation is necessary to establish scripture, but now that we have scripture, there's no need for revelation anymore. Anglican doesn't include the cessation of miracles as part of a governing text in the same way. Nevertheless, as Peter Deere tells us, by the time of the restoration, the Orthodox Anglican then held that the age of miracles was past. The need for them had not existed since the revelations recorded in the New Testament. This view, this view partly arises from the same background as Calvin's. Uh, resistance to Catholic appeals to miracles as showing their authority over Christendom. In Catholicism, early and late, miracles aren't improbable or even especially unlikely. In some circumstances, they are expected. Uh, in this way, Catholicism becomes associated with superstition in Britain. By the 18th century, Protestants scoffed at the false miracles supposedly worked in Pope's churches. The magical power claimed by the Roman clergy seemed to be part of a medieval world picture. They were out of place in an enlightened age. To hostile commentators, it was obvious why such superstition yeah, uh, I have an extra knot, it seems. Um, oh, sorry, I don't have an extra knot. It was not eliminated. Pilgrimages to shrines, payments to witnesses, witness miracles or to handle relics, all brought fat revenues for the church. The laity were duped so that their priests, especially idle monks, might live well. That's Colin Hayden. Uh, so Hume contributes to this tradition by telling the history of the dissolution of monasteries, and he gleefully recounts stories of how monks had deceived a credulous la laity through sleight of hand and mechanical tricks. The British see themselves as an island of rationality, facing off a continent mostly inhabited by superstitious papists. This is part of the motivation for Hume's initial appeal to John Tillotson's argument against transubstantiation. Hume wants to place himself in the Anglican tradition of rational anti-Catholicism. Okay, with this background in hand, let's turn to part two of Hume's essay on miracles. The first argument for thinking that religious testimony of a miracle is especially unreliable runs as follows. There's not to be found in all of history, any miracle attested by a sufficient number of men of such unquestioned good sense, education and learning as to secure us against all delusion in themselves of such undoubted integrity as to place them beyond all suspicion of any design to deceive others, of such credit and reputation in the eyes of mankind as to have a great deal to lose in case of their being detected in any falsehood, and at the same time attesting facts performed in such a public manner in so celebrated a part of the world as to render detection unavoidable. All which circumstances are requisite to give us a full assurance in the testimony of men. Call this the acme argument. There's never been a sufficiently well-attested religious miracle in history. On its own, this paragraph won't persuade anyone. Anyone who believes in testimony of some religious miracle believes its testimony is attested by sufficient numbers of good witnesses who aren't trying to deceive anyone. Okay, not only does the acme argument seem unpersuasive on a first reading, but it seems as if Hume contradicts himself a little later on. In the initial statement of the argument, Hume denies that witnesses of a reported miracle uh, has ever had all the following desiderata. One, a sufficient number. Two, undoubted integrity. Three, credit and reputation. Four, good sense, education, and learning. And five, living in so celebrated a part of the world as to render the detection unavoidable. A little later, uh, Hume claims that a cloud of witnesses testify to the healings around the tomb of the Jansenist Francois de Paris. And what is more extraordinary, many of the miracles were proved upon the spot before judges of unquestioned integrity, attested by witnesses of credit and distinction in a learned age and on the most eminent theater that is now in the world. Um, Hume goes out of the way to say that these attestations meet the five desiderata that he earlier said are never met. After quoting these texts, the English naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace exclaims, it seems almost incredible that this can have been written by the great skeptic 
David Hume, and written in the same work in which he has already affirmed that in all history, no such evidence is to be found. If I hadn't primed you already with tales of anti-Catholic prejudice, you might follow Wallace in wondering what's going on here. In the final analysis, Hume assumes that there weren't any miracles around Paris' tomb, and he assumes that his readers will agree with him. Having evoked that reaction, he asks his readers to diagnose their judgment. And what have we to oppose such a cloud of witnesses, but the absolute impossibility or miraculous nature of the events which they re re relate? And this surely in the eyes of all reasonable people will be regarded as, as sufficient refutation. Given what Hume says about the eight day eclipse at the end of the essay and given his views about possibility, I take his expression absolute impossibility with a grain of salt. I think he thinks there's merely a proof against miracles, meaning such arguments from experience as leave no doubt, room for doubt or opposition. Hume believes as readers reject Catholic miracles for the right reason, namely that it contradicts the strong inductive evidence we have that laws of nature work without exceptions. The next step he believes is to get his reader to generalize the attitude to the miracles of the Old and New Testament. All right, let me stipulate that an argument begs the question if no one in his attended audience is likely to accept its premises unless they already believe the conclusion. In that stipulated sense, Hume isn't begging the question at issue by presupposing the falsehood of the testimony of Jansenists. He isn't writing for Jansenists. He's writing for British Protestants in the middle of the 18th century. Given the anti-Catholicism at the time, Hume's readers will reject Catholic miracle stories with at least as much confidence as Hume himself shows. Uh, only in light of the purported Jansenist miracles is the end Acme argument anything more than an undeveloped assertion. Uh, as Hume presents the case, the Jansenist miracles are the best attested miracles in history. Uh, theologians should co who collect miracles should adopt one of them, the one that cured Pascal's niece, Marguerite Pereira, this is her, uh, as being worth more a thousand times than all the rest of their collection. So just to situate, right, so uh, the miracle of the holy thorn that cures um, Pereira is in 1656, right, near the beginning of the Jansenist movement, and um, Paris dies in 1727, uh, near, near the end, or... Um... Okay, so the miracle of the thorn, which is the 17th century miracle, is worth more than, a thousand times more, of all the miracles, the rest of the miracles in the theologian's collection, right? And the theologian's collection of miracles, uh, of course, extends to uh, the Old and New Testament. If that testimony doesn't suffice to uh, establish a miracle, that is the miracle of the Holy Thorn, then no testimony does. Uh, since hardly any of Hume's readers would be tempted by a Catholic miracle, they faced a forceful argument. As Brandon Watson writes, the miracle of the Holy Thorn, precisely because of the quality of his attestation, becomes part of Hume's argument that we can never believe a religious miracle on testimony. Okay, according to Richard Swinburne in Hume's discussion of the miracles around Paris' tomb, the credibility of the witnesses in terms of their number, integrity, and education is dismissed, not as inadequate, but as irrelevant. This misunderstands the form of Hume's argument. He emphasizes, as far as he can, the number, integrity, and education of the witnesses, and takes it for granted that his readers will deny that anything miraculous happened at the tomb. In this way, the tension that Wallace points to dissolves. This is the best there is, and it isn't good enough. What Hume does in his analysis of the Jansenist miracles, according to Francis Beckwith, is simply to beg the question in favor of naturalism. This is also a misunderstanding. Hume takes a premise that almost all of his readers believe that the Jansenist miracles aren't genuine, praises the quality of the witnesses of these miracles to the skies and infers that there's never been sufficiently good testimony for the miracle. He isn't begging the question by assuming the falsity of Jensen's miracles. He just knows his audience. Okay, how does the Acme argument in part relate to part one of Hume's essay on miracles? The conclusion of the Acme argument is there's not to be found in all history any miracle uh, attested by witnesses whose backgrounds secure us against all delusion and of such undoubted integrity as to place them beyond all suspicion of any design to deceive others. 
that's higher than the ordinary standard for accepting testimony. Hume is assuming that the argument of part one raises the standard that we should require from testimony in order to show a violation of law of nature. And the ACME argument attempts to show that this standard isn't met in the best attested cases. We might worry that the ACME argument depends essentially on anti-Catholic bigotry, but the argument would have had some force in France. Right. By the middle of the 18th century, Jansenism is no longer the austere and somewhat respectable movement it had been in the time of Pascal and Arnaud. After Pope Clement XI's condemnation of 101 Jansenist propositions in 1713, Jansenism is transformed into a locus of political disgruntlement. The purported miracles around Paris tomb around his death in 1727 give rise to a movement of worshipers beset by convulsions and the suppression of that movement gives rise to a splinter group of self-torturers in the 1740s. Convulsion heirs are generally despised or pitied in Hume, by Hume's philosophically minded French audience. Um, in his role as acting ambassador to France in 1765, Hume reports to the British Secretary of State that the assembled clergy in France are very unhappy that the state keeps them from condemning Jansenism with full vigor. The central maxim of Hume's essay on miracles is that testimony should be evaluated not just on the circumstances of the production of the testimony, but on the content of what is testified to. The case of the Jansenist miracles is a nice illustration of that maxim. Our attitude towards the testimony depends not just on our beliefs about the character, number, and reputations of the witnesses, but also on our attitude towards Jansenism. Hume knows what his reader's attitude would be, and he relies on those attitudes for argumentative and rhetorical purposes. Okay, uh, contrary religions. Hume's fourth argument for the unreliability of religious testimony for miracles is usually called the contrary religions argument in the literature. Hume assumes that more than one religion can't be true. In matters of religion, what is different is contrary. If there's no religion that produces an absolute majority of testimonies of miracles, then most religious testimony is untrustworthy. Thus, religious miraculous testimony that seems to support a religious system undermines not only the likelihood of rival religions, but undermines the reliability of any testimony for miracles that are supposed to support a religion. Thus, the unreliability of testimony for rival miracles boomerangs thus back on the initial religious system, destroying, quote, the credit of those miracles on which that system was established. So, for example, the miracles in Herodotus and Plutarch, two pagan ancient Greek authors, undermine the reliability of the miracles in the Venerable Bede and Juan Mariana, two monkish historians. Uh, Hume gestures around the world in giving examples of uh, contrary miracles of ancient Rome, of Turkey, of Siam, and of China, and a little later to any miracle of Muhammad or his successors and to Grecian, Chinese, and Roman Catholic witnesses for purported witnesses. Sorry, witnesses for purported miracles. Uh, Hume doesn't seem to have put a lot of thought into some of these examples. The Confucianism of Qing Dynasty China, to take one example, is not a hotbed of miracle stories. The one non-Christian miracle that Hume describes in any detail, that of Vespasian curing two men in Alexandria, is underwhelming. The blind man who was cured by Vespasian's spittle wasn't entirely blind to begin with, and the description of the useless hand being fixed by the emperor stepping on it is compatible with its being the natural restitution of a dislocated finger. The right way to think about Hume's fourth argument is in its anti-Catholic context. I think the primary tension that Hume hopes to exploit is between this compatriot's rejection of Catholic miracles and their exception of the miracles of the Bible. Uh, besides the miracle of the holy thorn and the healings around Paris tomb, Hume also describes a purported miraculous healing in the Saragossa Cathedral that Cardinal de Retz dismisses out of hand. And he lists uh, Bede and Mar Nara Mariana, as monkish historians whose miracle stories are incompatible of those um, ancient pagan authors. And his readers would have taken Bede and Mariana to be just filled with superstition stories, superstitious stories that couldn't be believed. The Catholic miracle stories that had accumulated over the years radically outnumber the miracle stories of the Bible. 
Since 18th century British Protestants don't take Catholic miracle stories in the least bit seriously, they have to admit that most testimony that a religious miracle has occurred is false, and thus that that's, that testimony of that sort is unreliable. Hume's argument shows how rejecting Catholic miracles could reasonably lead to rejecting all miracles. Swinburne, Gaskin, and Bruce Langtree uh, all make the point that not every worship of a god is contrary to the worship of every other god, especially in a polytheistic pantheon. If a priest of Athena manages to pull off a miracle that makes testimony reporting miraculous activity from Apollo, Sorry, if a priest of Athena pulls off a miracle, that makes the likelihood that uh, uh, a priest of Apollo has achieved miraculous activity more likely rather than less, uh, insofar as the contrary religion argument is abstracted away from its theological context. It's not any good. So don't abstract it from its theological context. Uh, the inquiry concerning human understanding ends with a recommendation to burn any book that is neither an abstract discussion of, of quantity nor an empirical investigation of matters of fact. An implication of this dichotomy is that philosophy, including the contents of the first inquiry, ought to be an empirical endeavor. By Hume's lights, of course, it is a mere matter of fact that polytheism is false, and also a mere matter of fact that testimony about religious miracles is unreliable. His argument can't be expected to extend to situations where polytheism is true or where religious testimony is perfectly reliable. His claim is that given the facts about testimony about religion as they are, religiously motivated testimony that a miracle has occurred is unreliable. Okay, how does the contrary religions argument relate to part one of the essay on miracles? In summing up part two, Hume writes, upon the whole then it appears that no testimony for any kind of miracle has ever amounted to a probability, much less to a proof. And that even supposing that it amounted to a proof, it would be opposed by another proof derived from the very nature of the fact, which it would endeavor to establish. Hume takes himself to have established in part one, there's, there's a proof that is uniform experience that's if you just look at the experience, uh, isn't subject to doubt, uh, in favor of the laws of nature, and that testimonial evidence for a miracle would have to rise to the level of proof on the other side in order to possibly be accepted. Hume's summary of part two is that not only does religiously motivated testimony for miracles not meet the standard of proof, it doesn't meet the far lower standard of probability. We may attribute to Hume the principle that if most Fs aren't G, then probably the next one won't be either. If a Protestant is willing to grant that most miracle stories are in defense of Catholicism or you know, non-Christian religions and insists that these stories are mostly false, that takes some work to avoid the conclusion that an, arbitrary, an arbitrarily selected miracle is probably false. One way out here is to draw distinctions between kinds of testimony stories for miracles. And one obvious criterion is by independently considering the likelihood of the attested doctrine. As Pascal pointed out in, in Ponce's that were sort of provoked by thinking about his niece, uh, there's a danger of running in a circle here. If a doctrine determines miracles, then miracles are useless for doctrine. Moreover, it isn't obvious ahead of time about how such an inquiry is going to turn out. If natural reason tells you that the doctrine of hell is wicked, you might end up rejecting the veracity of all of Jesus' miracles for that reason. Um, the argument of miracles is an inductive argument, and like all inductive arguments, it depends on the background knowledge of its readers. Whether or not we are entitled to infer that all swans are white from all swans observed in Europe in the 18th century are white depends on what else we know and believe. Someone who believes that Catholicism is superstition will believe that testimony for Catholic miracles is unreliable. Um, such a person on the assumption that testimony for Catholic miracles is a large portion of testimony for miracles, such a person will be entitled to infer, generally speaking, that testimony for religious miracles is unreliable. I feel like I'm going slower than I thought. I'm going to skip a little bit, sort of arguing for the force of the argument today. Um, the contrary religions argument wouldn't convince any Catholics in the form that Hume presents it. 
It might work if reconstructed. Some Protestant denominations, including Methodists and Pentecostals, believe that miracles continue to be performed after the early days of the church. Hindu, Buddhist, and Muslim traditions have their miracle stories, and there are stories of pagan miracles in the ancient world. A Catholic may deny the veracity of such stories, do the math and conclude that a relatively large percentage of miracle stories are false. The question then arises, if testimony about religious miracles is unreliable, why should I believe in the miracles that I do? Okay, I've been arguing that we should think of some of the arguments in part two of Hume's essay on miracles as reductius ad Catholicism. If it's reasonable to believe in the miracles of the Bible, then it's reasonable uh, to believe in Catholic miracles, but we ought not believe in Catholic miracles. So we ought not believe in the miracles of the Bible. Decisive evidence that this form of reasoning is at the core of Hume's argument comes in a letter that he wrote to George Campbell, who had criticized Hume's treatment of miracles. Hume writes a polite letter and tells the story of how he came up with the argument. It may perhaps amuse you to first lear to learn the first hint, which suggested to me the argument which you have suggest uh, which you have so strenuously attacked. I was walking in the cloisters of the Jesuits College of La Flèche and engaged in conversation with a Jesuit of some parts and learning who was relating to me and urging some nonsensical miracle performed in the convent. This argument immediately occurred to me, and I thought it very much graveled my companion, but at last he observed to me that it was impossible for that argument to have any solidity because it operated equally against the gospel as the Catholic miracles, which observation I thought proper to admit as a sufficient answer. This letter suggests two arguments. First, a ground level argument that events that are unprecedented or break the laws of nature are very unlikely and less likely than the invention of the story. This is the argument that Hume first offers to the Jesuit and the argument of part one of section 10. The letter also suggests a second argument against miracles suitable to give to Protestants such as Campbell. If we have good reasons to doubt Catholic miracles, then we have good reasons to doubt the gospels. The thought that the falsity of Catholicism may be used more generally against miracles more generally, is thus present at the inception of Hume's thinking on the subject. Hume offers a version of the Jesuits conditional for miracles around de Perry's tomb. Considered merely as human testimony, he writes, the Jansenist miracles much surpass the miracles of Jesus in evidence and authority. On my reading, justifying that comparison is central to Hume's argumentative purposes. If you don't believe in the Jansenist miracles, then you ought not believe in the miracles of the New Testament. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip a smidgen. Uh, so this is how Hume's argument was read at the time. Uh, so Thomas Rutherford is one of the first um, critics of Hume and he says, look, we may be lazy and want to dismiss all papist miracles quickly, but we want to be careful because if we do that, we'll undermine the, the foundations of Christianity. And he says, instead, we just have to go case through case through every published miracle and show how uh, the, the, it's somehow inconsistent with our knowledge of God or of the facts. And as a model, he cites an argument from George Littleton's observation on the conversion of St. Paul, where Littleton said, well, and so this is um, Rutherford, quoting Littleton or you know, paraphrasing Littleton, that because the miracles of the tomb of, around the tomb of uh, Perry stopped once the authorities walled off the church, that shows that they weren't done by God because God can't be stopped by a wall. Uh, so Rutherford, well, so here's Hume replying to Littleton. This will be before Rutherford publishes, but it's in the inquiry anyway. Um, that this can't be right, right? Because, you know, uh, it's the touch of the tomb that produces these effects. And when you don't touch the tomb, you don't get the effects. Now it's true that God could have made the effect even when you're not touching the tomb, but that's not how miracles work. They don't work in a kind of systematic way. Uh, it's not true that everything that's a miracle in the Old or New Testament, you can expect to happen uh, just like that. Okay, um, 
So according to Swinburne, uh, most alleged miracles, if they occurred as reported, would show at most the power of God, of God or gods and the, their concern with the needs of men and little more specific in the way of doctrine. It's true and important that there's a great deal of flexibility in interpreting what a miracle story signifies. It's worth mentioning, however, that the Jansenist miracles in the early modern period aren't given this kind of generic interpretation. Of the miracle of the Holy Thor, Hume reports the Queen Regent of France, who was extremely prejudiced against the Port Royal, sent her own physician to examine the miracle, who returned an absolute convent and save for a time that famous monastery from the ruin with which it was threatened. And as Hume says, the purported miracle persuades Anne of Austria, the young Louis XIV's mother, to stop harassing Port Royal's abbeys. Similarly, the miracles around Paris' tomb are taken as evident that God opposes the condemnation of the Jansenists. Suppose we disassociate miracles from the doctrines which they are supposed to vindicate. Suppose we separate the miracle of the Holy Thorn from the question of whether the Port Royal Abbey should be closed. Suppose we separate the cross of light that is supposed to have appeared over the Milvian Bridge from the question of whether the Roman Empire should be Christian. And suppose we separate Jesus's miracles from the golden rule, the doctrine of hell. What lessons might we draw from the phenomena once they are stripped down in this way? Wallace is an interesting figure in this regard. As I said earlier, he sees a tension between Hume's assertion that no example of a testimony of religious miracle was ever good enough to merit belief in the attested miracle and his sympathetic description, that is Hume's sympathetic description of the quality of the witnesses for the Jansenist miracles. Wallace resolves the tension by concluding that the Jansenist miracle, sorry, Jansenist testimony is trustworthy and he goes into some detail in recapitulating the case of Louise Corinne. Wallace is not a Jansenist. Uh, so he needs an account of what the Jansenist testimony signifies. In 1865, he begins attending seances and he soon becomes convinced of the existence of a realm of spirits. On this hypothesis, modern Roman Catholic miracles become intelligible facts. Spirits whose affections and passions are strongly excited in favor of Catholicism produce those appearances of the Virgin and of saints, which they know will tend to increase religious fervor. The appearance itself may be an objective reality, while it is only an inference that it is the Virgin Mary, um, an inference which every intelligent spiritualist would repudiate as in the highest degree improbable. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. According to Wallace, the miracles around Paris' tomb are produced by spirits who aren't agents of the Catholic God, his mother, or his saints, but who want to inspire religious feeling. I earlier described Wallace as a naturalist because he spent years studying plants and animals in the Amazon basin and on the Malay Peninsula and because he was the co-discoverer of natural selection. He is not a naturalist in the sense that he didn't denied the existence of intelligent ethereal spirits. If you're not a Jansenist, but you believe that some of them witnessed violations of the laws of nature, then you ought to say something about what those mean. Well, Wallace says something. Okay, that's it. Uh, Thank you. Sure. Uh, um, Turn off the screen. Oh yes, I can. I can do that for you. Um, okay, so we have a few questions. The first from Maureen Ellis. Okay. Uh, she can. She can. Uh, Maureen, you're muted. Unmute. Which might not be here. So I have unmuted. Okay. Great. Sorry. I have typed the question in. Thanks, Claudia. But uh, Michael, Michael, can you see the question? I can see the question. Um, so He's asking why people are having so much difficulty understanding metaphor, which is so much a part of our lives. You know, every day you can say things like, I'm taking the last train home, I'm going to catch a cab. And none of this is literal. Even turning to God is not literal. Why are people having so much difficulty reading metaphor in their scriptures. Are you saying that the miracles of the Old and New Testament were metaphorical 
you know, taken to be metaphorical, both at the time of writing and in by any sensible Christian in between that time and this time? Well, I don't know about sensible. I wouldn't sort of necessarily categorize that way. But whether you take it, take it in exegetic terms or in hermeneutic terms, thanks to Wittgenstein and the linguistic turn, we now understand how every word, as Althusser said, is a bomb. And some people will take it literally, and some will see that most of what comes out of our mouths and 90 yeah. plus percent of communication is metaphoric. So why this difficulty? Well, look, the argument is not an argument against a metaphorical interpretation of the Bible. Uh, insofar as it has any force at all, it's against testimony that a literal miracle has occurred. And so if you, if you are willing to say that, you know, this is not a straw man <laughs> and that this is the standard view that Christians for most of, you know, history have taken, that there were actual miracles that occurred, then, um, you know, what you say about metaphor is a kind of balm, right? Suppose someone is, suppose a Christian is persuaded by Hume's argument, you can rush in and reassure them and say, well, look, it's, it's just a metaphor and, and the importance. No, it's not a matter of my persuading anybody. We have had the benefit of people like uh, Carl Gustav Jung uh, telling, showing us in his own life and work and writings, how psychology works and how uh, psychotherapy works. Uh, and how we don't differ from the primitives except in our assumptions. It's those basic, whether virgin assumption or whatever assumptions and presuppositions, that's what is the foundation. And it's up to us to interpret in the light of current science, current philosophy, current common sense. Isn't it? Or I'm, I guess I don't disagree. I, I, I guess I, I, I feel like... Yes, we should we should interpret uh, religious works as best we can in, in in accordance with all that we know. Thank you. Um, we have to move on now. Uh, oh, thank you, Maureen. Uh, Mark Bosflug, I might have uh, butchered your name, but you have. Uh, thank you. It's Bass Fluke. Thank you very Bass much. Fluke. Thank you. Um, well, well, thank you, Michael. That was very interesting. So, my question for you has to do with how I've understood Hume on this score. And it has to do specifically with him directing this toward Locke. And since you know a lot about Locke, hopefully you'll be able to uh, tell me what you think. Um, so my sense is that on the one hand, those criteria that you had mentioned uh, that Hume deploys against um, certain uh, purported uh, uh, witness uh, miracles, these are found, you know, right in Locke in um, book four, chapter 15, um, his little epistemology of testimony that you get right there. Um, not only this, Locke talks about experience as this measure for um, evaluating testimony. Likewise, he goes on to make this famous claim about um, how rationality amounts to proportioning one's assent um, such, uh, to a proposition such that it accords with your grounds for that proposition. Um, and then lastly, he, he goes on at the end of chapter 16 in book four to deploy his epistemology of testimony in the context mm -hmm. of purported miracles um, as corroboration for uh, revelation. So anyway, so, you know, if you go through and you look through um, Hume's essay on miracles, it's striking, it's positively striking how many of these elements are there and how prominently they're deployed. And so my sense was that, well, okay, what he's doing is he's just taking Locke's framework for evaluating testimony and deploying it against, you know, one of the chief uh, uses Locke has. And so I, I realize that this isn't sort of uh, exclusive of um, him directing it also toward Catholics, but uh, it, it would have seemed to me as though um, Locke was perhaps the primary target. So anyway, just wanted to hear your thoughts on all of that. The, the, so the essay is not directed towards or against Catholics, right? It's it's directed to Protestants, right? It's an argument. It's it it has much less force against uh, Jansenist than it would against the Protestants. The the argument is that Protestants are being inconsistent. Um, 
so so right when I say that the intended audience is um, uh, is uh, the intended audience are British Protestants. Um, so yeah, it's true that some of the apparatus that Locke uses is repeated in particular the proportionality principle and the criteria of testimony. So I think that's all fine. Um, I guess here's a way of, of answering your question. Uh, so, so Locke does take up the question of miracles in in like a little essay on miracles, which I, I don't know that uh, Hume is engaging with that. I, I um, perhaps not, um, but he does give an argument like this, which is here are three, here are three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, Christianity is compatible with all the miracles that are told in Judaism, and there are no miracles in Islam. And so, you know, Christianity wins out. Um, and they're just not as a matter of influence or, you know, Hume replying to that argument in particular. There are sort of really interesting contrasts there, right? One is that Hume says uh, that there are like mir a lot of miracles in the Quran. And, you know, sometimes some of the metaphors, I, I don't want to get to super caught. The, a kind of plain way of reading the Quran is to say it doesn't contain miracles. I mean, there are miracles that, in hadiths that surround it, but, but not in the Quran itself. And Locke had a copy of the Quran, like a French translation. Um, and I think it's, it's, Hume is actually following Bacon, who like refers to all the miracles in the Al-Quran, which shows a kind of lack of exposure. Um, and then the other contrast is that, you know, Hume divides up uh, Christianity between Protestantism and Catholicism in a way that Locke doesn't do there. And it's not clear that Locke could do, right? So Locke does think that, um, well, I mean, he asked the question to, to Newton in some place, like, when do miracles cease? And, you know, Locke is not a Catholic and not uh, sympathetic to Catholicism and someplace else he says well look we can just divide up religions by what they take to be authoritative texts and if you do that then Catholicism is a different religion than people than Protestants who take um, the Bible to be authoritative. So look I, I guess just to answer directly I think there are influences of, um, of Locke on Hume. I think this is kind of a pressure that these two different texts in Locke suggest could be heightened that when Locke individuates religions, he, in order to defend the miracles of the gospel, he doesn't treat Christianity, uh, Catholicism as a separate religion. But elsewhere, uh, when he has different purposes, he does. And I do think that the argument would have force against Locke because I do think Locke was an anti-Catholic. Well, thanks. I've got a couple other questions, but I'll let, let other folks go. So thank you. Sure. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so since we talked a bit about intended audience, maybe I'll skip to um, Anne-Marie Butler's question and circle back to uh, Daniel Cook afterwards. Thanks, because um, I did think this was a follow on. Um, so thanks for your talk, Michael. Uh, I actually do find suggest uh, helpful the suggestion that uh, his intended audience is a Protestant uh, English crowd, but I just wonder if the historical facts aren't on your side about the, the composition of this essay, because wasn't it originally intended to be included in the treatise, which he's writing in La Flesh while he's talking to Jesuits um, and trying to persuade them of the right account of the human mind? Well, I, it was always going to be written in English and published in England. So yes, yeah, so the, the, the essay is, is composed. I mean, he gets, as he tells Campbell, he gets the first ideas for the essay in the flesh. And in some ways, I kind of feel like he's telling Campbell, like, here's an obvious thing that we, that it, so, so um, you can't say, he can't say to the Jesuit, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, the, 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 the argument would have, sorry, let me just back up. Uh, I take the intended readership to be an English reading readership, which is primarily not the people of 
France. Uh, so he comes back to England in 1737 and tries to publish it there. Now, look, it is true that it's translated into French quickly and, and he gets a kind of rapturous reception when he goes to France in the 1760s. And we might want to know why, <laughs> like why if it's the case of this argument um, is, you know, in the first instance aimed to British Protestants, why is it the case that all the philosophers loved him so much? You know, it doesn't take much to persuade Diderot that there aren't miracles, right? I mean, he's the one who said that we'll have peace when the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last priest. Um, and also, the facts about Jansenism are, you know, that Jansenism was sort of disreputable at both for the philosophers and also for the, the almost everyone else is true. So, um, I mean, I do think that the argument could be effective and could be accepted by audiences other than uh, a, um, a Protestant audience. But I just think that if we wanna know what's going on with why he's spending so much effort to praise these Jansenist miracles, uh, we have to understand that he's doing it for audiences that would reject them out of hand. And to be sure, that'll actually be true of a lot of France in the, in the 18th century. I, um, I have a follow-up on this. Um, so on the question of audience, um, could you tell us more about the figure of the Cardinal de Ret that appears uh, before? in the little anecdote with he saw a miracle, but he was able to act as a just uh, reasoner. Um, is that like sort of supposed to indicate, you know, there, there are various kinds of Catholics or is it doing something else? Well, I mean, de Ritz was a controversial figure. He was like involved in the Fronde, which is this rebellion. Um, I guess I didn't, I mean, sort of, I mean, it's meant to distinguish between uh, the kind of Catholic who would believe in the Saragossa miracle and the kind of Catholic who would not. And I think, um, I, I don't, well, so look, the example shows that at least some Catholics wouldn't in, be inclined to believe it. I, it's hard to know, but I kind of imagine that this is sort of like a tourist trap kind of thing that they were doing in Saragossa. I mean, there is like an official apparatus which has grown up in the Catholic church for sorting out true and false miracles. And um, I don't think it was fully in play. I, so look, it, it does have to go into play when you're deciding whether to beatify and to canonize people. And um, I don't know, I wouldn't be surprised if um, it was sort of, ordinary wisdom among the uh, among Catholics to, um, I don't know, I mean, maybe it's like a way of drawing the line between the gullible and the pious, right? There's a, there's a bit in Henry VI, part one or two, where like uh, Henry VI is willing to give money to someone who claims that his sight was just re uh, restored and his uncle who's sort of the sensible one, like does a little test and starts saying, okay, so if you just had your, he just sort of gets them to say like what color the grass is and that kind of thing. And, and if your sight was just restored, you wouldn't be able to say that. Anyway, so I, I guess I would think, um, yes, that it certainly shows that there are Catholics who would believe in this and Catholics who wouldn't. And I guess, just thinking about human nature, I suspect that not absolutely everyone is going to be willing to give money to someone claiming such a story outside the cathedral. So that's all I have for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we actually have two more questions that came in around this topic. So maybe uh, Jonathan and, jo and then John. Thanks. Uh, so I just had a question about your use of the Westminster Confession of Faith near the beginning. Uh, Specifically, you're, you're trying to reconstruct the English speaking Protestants uh, as downplaying or uh, denying like the existence of miracles and other special divine action. And I, I'm not, I, I think you're making too strong of a claim. So I'm kind of like wondering how important is that for your reliance 
I'm sorry, how important is that reliance on the Westminster Confession of Faith for your argument in reconstructing it? Because um, Westminster Confession, from my understanding, its focus is not denying miracles and other special divine action in general, but it's focusing specifically on special revelation that is around the category of inscripturation where like prophets are carried by the Holy Spirit to, you know, carry out God's, God's words in a sense. And so it's, it's going to be about that. And then like only miracles insofar as they're attesting to the authority or the authenticity of that writing. It's not going to be denying things of special divine action, like healing or Eucharist or regeneration, like being born again and other things like that. So it's like, I mean, these may be construed as superstitious by some standards, but like they would not have been understood as superstitious back then. And they would be relatively common, they would think. Yes, excellent. Okay, so um, one is it, in, the, in the 18th century, the Westminster Confession only governed the Church of Scotland. It didn't govern the Anglicans. Um, and uh, it's true that like the original, the, the uh, yeah, so the sort of original accounts of what happens during the Eucharist in the reform and Lutheran traditions do involve, involve miracles. They just turn out not to be the miracles that, um, the miracle that uh, the Catholics thought with the special metaphysics. So um, it's also true, and this is switching to the Anglican side and the bit about Tillotson, like Tillotson was Archbishop of Canterbury, right? And so he's got an argument which he phrases against being against transubstantiation and Hume in summarizing Tillotson's phrases being against the real presence where the real presence is a more generic claim um, about uh, sort of miraculous happenings miraculous presence in the Eucharist. So the, the, the short answer is, um, is yes, that's true. Um, and a slightly longer answer is, I'm mostly trying to say something about the, um, the background to Hume's essay and how it came to be the case that the British thought that, the British Protestants thought that, that Catholicism was superstitious. And part of it has to do with this move that Calvin made against Catholics who said, look, we've got all these miracles, where are your miracles? And um, I think that, I think we should be precise and theologians should be precise. But when we're sort of gesturing at, how did this happen? Like, how did, how did, uh, how did the Scots come to think? that, uh, or and how did the, the English come to think that Catholicism was superstitious? I think it's useful to sort of know about that first central move. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have seven minutes left or something like that. Uh, Daniel Cook. I enjoyed what you were saying. I'm just wondering whether you didn't just want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, and that he was an atheist, and that he didn't believe, and that by attacking the Catholics, he was also undermining Anglicanism. I mean, look at the mysteries, the Christian mysteries, which are the central part of Christianity. And while they're involved in miracles, of course, uh, you know, I don't know if he talks much about the actual mysteries, but uh, other than the Eucharist, which you mentioned. And also, I'm wondering, you know, Hume relies on the purported rarity or uniqueness of an event to see it as a miracle. But that, you know, Leibniz objects to that. He doesn't think that the rarity of an event is enough to make one think it's a miracle. And of course, he believes in the supernatural or some beyond the higher order. Did Hume ever, uh, the Hume doesn't believe in any of that, does he? I mean, I, I just don't see as an inductivist that he's going to, and as an empiricist, that he believes in, in any of these um, religious discussions. It's pardon the, the curt request. 
Uh, yes, definitely. Right. That's the conclusion. The conclusion is that uh, you should never believe in religious testimony about a miracle. And I think beyond that, Hume believes that the world is, you know, uh, exceptionlessly governed by laws. Right. The, the, that is the ultimate point. The question is, does he beg the question? And really, everything I was doing was trying to show that he's not begging the question because his audience would have seen, read these, some of the things that Hume says in, in a way differently than we would have read. Um, and as to the second question about, is a miracle just a unique event? That's, that's connected to part one. And I guess I think Hume doesn't draw a, a sharp enough distinction between um, uniform experience and the laws of nature. And this leads him to underestimate the force of his argument. Like what we should say <laughs> is that, viol exactly. that that unique events, you know, they happen all the time. Uh, and, that, uh, and that violations of the laws of nature are less probable than a unique event. But it's not clear that the way that Hume presents his argument in part one gets that result. But I think the result is true. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the last question, uh, John cannot read his question because his microphone doesn't work, so I'll read it for him, right? So this is regarding the Hume's note on the Jansenist miracles. He seems to say that scripture is the product of divine testimony and calls ridiculous the comparison between such kind of evidence and the evidence on which the Jansenist miracles are grounded, regular human testimony. Do you think that Hume seriously entertains such a view of scripture? Uh, no. Uh, so I tend to read Hume as less ironic than almost all commentators, but sometimes the force of irony <laughs> cannot be resisted. Um, I think that that's, um, that, that is a, uh, a subterfuge, um, that, that his real view, so, so the bit about divine, yeah, so the bit about divine testimony is a warm up to the bit about human testimony that he thinks that with if you're comparing these by standards that are commensurable, then the Jansenist, the testimony for the Jansenist miracles is greater than the testimony for the, the, test, the miracles of the, of the gospels. Okay, thank you very much. And um, that concludes all of our questions. Let's maybe unmute ourselves and uh, thank our speakers by applauding. Um, Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and see you all next week when we will be talking about the history of medicine, if I'm not mistaken. Sweet. Thank you all. And again, if you've got questions that have lingered, feel free to email me. Thank you. Thanks.